Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Hu Yong Wong. I'm an associate professor in electrical engineering at San Jose State University. It's very nice to meet you all virtually. I'm sorry that I'm traveling for a conference and I cannot present in person. And thank you very much for staying for my talk. I know all of you had lunch, had a great lunch, and now you must be very sleepy, but do not fall asleep, please. I will talk about the overview of the quantum computing system and the QB readout here, and why I'm here. Besides this, the main purpose is to tell you from an engineer perspective, how we can contribute to the quantum computing industry. I feel that engineers are very important. I mean, the classical engineer, right? Then I will give an overview of the quantum computing system and then we discuss various components. I will also talk about the readout process of the computer that you are using and followed by conclusion. This will be the main slide that I want you to remember. In the semiconductor time, the physicists come up with a lot of very difficult equations. They understand the many body system crystals. And for example, they come up how the carrier gets scattered in a silicon using Fermi golden rule, broad function and all those uh, quantum treatment. What did the engineering engineers do? They convert it to an empirical equation yet uh, physical and implement them in a very efficient way in a commercial software and it is 100 million per year market. So now the quantum computer has the similar situation from my point of view. The physicists came up with this uh, second quantization, very complicated Hamiltonian, difficult to understand. I hope that the engineers together with the physicists can come up with some analytical equations, which is more practical and they form companies and they produce a lot of wonderful quantum chips. So that's one of the most important role I think an engineer can do. And that's why you're here. In a quantum computer, there are plenty of rooms that we can contribute from algorithm design or education to high speed circuit control. Here shows the quantum computer you are going to use in this workshop. It come up with a lot of FPGA and programming using Python, send out the pulse through a lot of microwave components, mixer, local oscillator, attenuator. These are all microwave engineering. And they need to go to cryogenic temperature at 10 mini Kelvin. There's a lot of vacuum and mechanical engineering. Then go to this chip. This is just a integrated chip. Again, it is a field for electrical engineer. And only the physics, the quantum physics only appeared in the tiny qubit. Then it go through a lot of amplifier. I need to say that this amplifier is not classical, it's a quantum limited amplifier. So in summary, like what I heard from another seminar, quantum computer is just the passive wave function engineering for the quantum part. But the real computing, to be frank, come from all the classical electronics. The qubits sit there, they're just a passive wave function doing nothing, okay? And here I want to advertise that I had a book published last year. It's very suitable for engineer because I don't assume any quantum physics knowledge or linear algebra knowledge. And after this book, you will be able to do quantum programming and understand Schwarz algorithm. So let's go from part by part. The direction refrigerator is the refrigerator that is used to cool down the qubits to less than 10 mini Kelvin. It uses a mixture of helium-3 and helium-4. Basically, it has two phases, a concentrated phase and a direct phase. By taking away the liquid helium from the direct phase, then the liquid helium free in the concentrated phase will try to diffuse across the boundary. And through this process, it is an endo endothermic process that is going to absorb heat from the environment. And that's how you cool down the device. Here again, no hardcore no hard quantum physics. 
So what does a quantum computer look like? This is the system we will use today or in this workshop. It, is manu it has a controller, which is manufactured by quantum machines, which is an array of FPGA that you can program them, program them and send out the pulse. Then you will go through a mixer to mix up with the local oscillator to bring it to a higher frequency. Then you will go through attenuator. The signal will then go through the circulator. Circulator is just like a runabout on the road, right? And then you will uh, interrogate the qubits through this transmission line. So again, here or classical. The signal will come back and then go through the amplifier train and then we detect it. Let's take a closer look of this paper, which is highly similar to the qubit you are using. It has a transmog qubit. This is a very tiny Josephson junction. It's shown by a two large capacitor, so it's a transmog. And then it's connected to a couple, I should say coupled to a resonator. And this resonator then go through uh, this transmission line and connect it to the rest of the electronics. Let's look at the signal amplification train first. You see that there are three amplifier, tuba, which is traveling wave parametric amplifier, HEMT, high electron mobility amplifier at about four Kelvin, and then room temperature amplifier. Why do we need all these amplifiers? Of course, we want to have a large gain, but there's some special reason to arrange them in this way. It is that we need to have the lowest noise figure in the first amplifier. What is noise figure? When you amplify a signal, you actually add additional noise to it besides amplifying the incoming signal and incoming noise. So your noise, your signal to noise ratio will degrade. So noise figure is talking about the ratio of the signal to noise ratio from the input to the signal to noise ratio at the output. You can see that I expect the signal to noise ratio to degrade, right? Because I add more noise to the amplifier. So the noise figure is telling you how good the amplifier is. From this Fritz equation, you see that the noise figure in the later stage really doesn't matter because they are diminished by the gain of the previous stage. The noise figure of the first stage is the most important. That's why we use something very special for the tuber, which is a quantum limited amplifier as the first stage because it has the lowest noise figure. What is a quantum limited amplifier? Let's take a look. What is a parametric amplifier that are uh, similar to what we use? But this just to give you a concept, this is not the amplifier that we're using, okay? This is just the concept. Imagine you have an LC tank. The signal is oscillating from high peak to low to zero and then to negative. When it is at peak, you have electric field. What if now I suddenly move the plates apart, the capacitance apart by delta D? The charge cannot be moved immediately, instantaneously, because they are mass, they, they are matter, right? So because of this, Q is the same, but the capacitor is reduced because it's the further away, the plates are further away. So your energy increase. So by moving the capacitor away, the plates away when you are at peak voltage, you actually inject energy to this system. And then they wait until there's no charge across the plate. Then there's no electric field. At this time, let me pull them back to the original location. Low energy is going to retrieve or inject into this system. So we repeat this also when it is at a negative peak. So basically we repeat this two times every cycle. So you pump the energy at two times of the frequency of the resonation, and then you can do the amplification, right? This is completely classical, okay? This is not what we are using, just to give you an idea what is parametric amplifier. What it is using in this system that you're going to use is the traveling wave parametric amplifier tuber. It is just like a transmission line, and, but the inductance are replaced by the nonlinear inductance, uh, uh, Josephson junction with nonlinear, which has nonlinear inductance, as we know, right? And you pump the energy to here, and then the signal will go in and eventually get amplified. I actually don't know this well, but I just want you to understand that 
it is a quantum limiter amplifier. It adds the minimum amount of noise to it. Okay. And why there's noise? Because of uncertainty principle. So basically, this is very difficult to reduce. Of course, you can do some squeezing or whatever, maybe. I don't know it well, right? Then let's look at the next stage at 4 Kelvin. This is the high electron mobility transistor, low noise amplifier. So for those who have studied device physics or know about free fry electronics, this type of device has very high electron mobility because it has a hetero structure and the dopant are put on the barrier so that they are far away from the carrier, from the electron. So electron does not feel the scattering. As a result, it has a very high frequency or a high speed, okay? And similar to the idea we mentioned earlier, it has multi-stage. The first stage, you want, to have, you want to have a low noise. And then the last stage, you try to have, uh, have fret gain, right? But anyway, the point I want to show you is that, come on, this is again what? traditional IC design. How do we send a signal? I want to keep my face so you can see me. How do we send a signal to the qubit to manipulate it? If you remember from the previous talk, we will send appropriate uh, microwave signal with the right frequency and also the right amplitude and the right phase. If we expand this one, you see that I can actually encapsulate the amplitude and phase into two number, I and Q. And that's how we do it. The quantum machine will send out the corresponding I and Q, then we're at this frequency, then it's going to mix with the local oscillator and then go to a higher frequency. It was done in a way so that only the omega L zero plus omega I F will exist, will, will, will be there, okay? And this signal will then go to the qubit. And remember the Hamiltonian of the qubit, it depends on the delta, which is the detuning, the difference of this frequency and the oscillate, the resonant frequency of the qubit, right? From zero to one. It also depends on the phase depends on this rapid frequency, which depends on A, okay? So all I want to say in this slide is this, how you manipulate a qubit is just by choosing the correct phase and amplitude. And we do this purely classically again. And through this, then we will be able to control the qubit through the Hamiltonian. Of course, that is quantum. Okay, I think you are very sleepy, please. Take a deep breath. And if the one sitting next to you is sleeping, then wake, wake him or her up. Okay, thank you very much. Let's continue. I try to finish it ASAP. So I want to talk about the readouts in the last part. There's something called cavity QED, cavity quantum electrodynamics. It's talking about the coupling of a cavity and an atom. The cavity has a resonance frequency. Atom has its transition frequency. And they have some coupling for G. So why this is so special? If they, you go through the math with the physics, it turned out that if the cavity frequency and the atom frequency are not the same, so you have so-called detuning, the difference is the detuning, you will change the apparent resonant frequency of the cavity. So what it means is that if I only have zero photon, I want to get one photon. Originally, I need omega L. I need to get a photon with the frequency of omega L. But if my atom is at the ground state, now the photon energy only need to be omega L minus G squared divided by delta. But if my atom is at the excited state, now I need omega, omega L plus G squared divided by delta. Okay, just take it for granted. This is just due to the interaction, okay? So what is a superconducting qubit? What we are doing here is something similar to the cavity QED, but it's circuit QED. We use the resonator to imitate the cavity, oh, and it is a resonator itself. And then we use a transmon qubit to uh, imitate an 
artificial atom. So it has two states, right? Zero and one. Zero extra Cooper pair and one extra Cooper pair. So now we have the same thing. If you have zero photon, zero charge Cooper pair there, in order to absorb one photon, you only need omega L minus G squared divided by delta because the state of the transmon change the resonance frequency of the resonator. Now, if I at one state, then I need omega L plus G squared divided by, by delta for it to absorb one photon. We call that this difference, G squared divided by delta L, the cross curve. And we say that the cavity resonant frequency is pulled by the artificial atom. So why this is so special? Now, if you look at the, how we read it is like this. If you are at different states, you are going to have different peak due to the cross curve. So when it is zero, it shift to the left. When it is one, it shift to the right. So we send a pulse to here and just see what is refractor. And based on what it is refractor, then we know whether it is zero and right, a zero or one. But of course, it is impossible for me to measure many times because the qubits will collapse uh, at the first time, right? So what will we do? Now here again, cross the transmission, uh, I mean the scattering matrix in the real and imaginary part. If I have cross cut, right? This may be the zero state and then it shifted by two chi to the one state. I will measure at the middle, just measure at one frequency. Now here I make it so that the imaginary part are both zero for both states. Now, if I get positive, then I for the real part, then I, I will know that this is one. If I get negative for the imaginary part, then I will know that this is zero. That is how we read the superconducting qubit. Well, but in real world, there are noise. So there's only that it is it's not going to be too distinguishable value, right? So two distinct value, right? So because of noise, sometimes it will fluctuate. As a result, we will form this IQ block, which you will do the experiment uh, in this workshop also. And you will see that if you don't have enough power, don't enough not enough resolution, they will just merge and you cannot distinguish zero and one. Similar strategy is used for other reading, such as, as uh, silicon qubit quantum dot, uh, here I just show the paper. You can read in detail. Uh, I won't go. Uh, I won't discuss now because of time. Okay. Finally, advertisement again. I have this book. You should be able to download for free uh, from the institution which has subscribed it. I also have been uploading the teaching video to quantum algorithm and also quantum computing hardware architecture, in which we discuss the detail detail of spin qubit. Um, superconducting qubit, photonic qubit, and trap ion qubit. Uh, we go to the Hamiltonians. You can take a look if you are interested. So finally, I just want to say that uh, engineers play a very important role in quantum computing. It's very a very good time to jump into it now, and I hope that you can find your seat. Thank you very much. <laughs>